All right, this video is gonna take a look at the three node constant strain triangle element, which is the first planar element we're gonna be taking a look at after looking at the one dimensional elements such as the truss beam and frame elements. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So first let's look at some basic information about the constant strain triangle element. Well, we have three nodes. There they are. Note that the order is counterclockwise. That's something that is consistent with any type of planar element. The node ordering within the element will be counterclockwise. The actual you know, global numbers might be whatever, but within the element, it will always know that they will always have the counterclockwise order. Okay, at each node, we have two degrees of freedom. Note that it is only the translational stiffness there. We do not have rotational stiffness at any of the nodes. So only two degrees of freedom per node. And the shape functions are linear and they are assumed. We assume the shape functions for these elements. And this differs from what we have for the line elements. For the line elements, those shape functions were not necessarily assumed, but they were actually based on mechanics theory. They were based on Hooke's law. They were based on the equation of the elastic curve for the beam stiffness. So for these elements, the shape functions are assumed. In other words, they sort of assume that this is the displacement that could take place throughout this element. Okay, and so the displacement being based on the shape functions also can vary linearly throughout the element. And the strain being the derivative of the displacement means that it can only be constant throughout this element, hence the name constant strain triangle. Okay, so, whoops, let's go ahead and see what we got there. All right, one important thing to note is that convergence is required for these elements because the shape functions are assumed. Since we assume the shape functions, that means that convergence is required and it is not just true for the constant strain triangle element, but it's true for any 2D or 3D element. Okay, so here we're gonna take a look at why we only have X and Y translational stiffness and no bending stiffness. And the short answer is bending stiffness would be redundant. It's unnecessary. In order to show this, let's go ahead and take a look at two different elements where it's connected at the top and bottom nodes there. So two elements connected at two nodes. And you'll note that because two is connected to one at these two different nodes, it can't freely rotate about either one. If it tried to rotate about the top, it would have this node down here holding it back. Similarly, if it tried to rotate it about the bottom node, the top node would hold it back. Okay, so for that reason, it doesn't need bending a rotational stiffness to make sure that it maintains its connection with the element like it would like like you do need for line elements where line elements are only connected at one node so for those you do need rotational stiffness in order for it not to be a hinge joint here that's not important because there's two nodes connecting them all right so here's a table that will hopefully be useful as a reference for which type of elements include what types of stiffness and the important thing to note is, if you see that a type of element, you know, for example, a one-dimensional line element, and if it, the space it exists in is the same as the, the, pardon me, the dimensions of the element, then rotational stiffness is not necessary. For example, here, that one-dimensional line element in 1D space, well, wouldn't that just be a truss element? And because it's just in 1D space, well, it can only move essentially along the x-axis. Rotation is impossible, so we don't need it. But once we start moving that line element into 2D space and 3D space, then rotational stiffness becomes important. Okay, similarly, we're gonna take a look at our plane stress or strain element, similar to the constant strain triangle element we're looking at here. If we take that element, it's a two-dimensional element, and it's in two-dimensional space, we do not need rotational stiffness. But if we took that same two-dimensional element 
and put it into three-dimensional space, this type of element is called a shell element, well then rotational stiffness becomes important. All right, then moving on to a three-dimensional element, well you can't go beyond three-dimensional space, so at least that I'm aware of, maybe some high-level physicists know of some other dimensions, but all I know of is three-dimensional space, so we have three-dimensional elements in three-dimensional space, and for that reason, no rotational stiffness is necessary at each node. All right, so that was just a side note that we could use for reference. Moving back to the constant strain triangle, and we're looking at how it moves and the importance of knowing how it moves, that is used for that assumption that we use linear shape functions. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at horizontal displacement. First, we can have the element just translate so there's a constant there. The next thing we could have it is it could vary or it can elongate, it can move more with x, right? No displacement there, but that displacement increases with x, increases linearly with x, so that's why we have that term there. And similarly, we can have it, the displacement, pardon me, the displacement in the x direction can vary with y. So we have these three different terms, and those are the only methods that this can move. So it can vary linearly in x and it can vary linearly in y. And the same is true for vertical displacement. So we can have vertical translation, we can have vertical variation with x, right? Notice that this displacement in the y direction increases as we move with x, and similarly we can have a displacement that increases with y. All right, so both those, both the x and y displacement are, can vary linearly, pardon me, can vary linearly in the x and y direction. All right, so there's our triangle element. Here are our equations for the displacements in the x and the y directions, u and v accordingly. And because displacements can vary linearly, that means that our strain must be constant because the strain is the derivative of our displacements with respect to x and y. As you can see, if we do take the derivatives of those displacements, that's exactly what we get, just a bunch of constants. So that's where the name, the constant strain triangle, comes about. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and represent the displacement functions in terms of the shape functions and the corresponding nodal displacements. All right, and this was done for the beam element and the frame element. Here we have our displacement in the x direction. Oh, I guess the, there we go, there's the arrow. It didn't come up for a little while. There's the displacement in the y direction, right? Each of these has a shape function and the corresponding nodal displacement. We have the x direction and we have the y direction. There's our element. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a few little graphs here. Try to imagine that this element, that triangular element, is sort of lying in this xy plane. It's meant to be a 3D plot where we're going to draw out what these shape functions look like and show that these shape functions are going to vary linearly. See, here's the shape function for node i. Note that it's 1 at node i. It's 0 at those other nodes. Similarly for j, 1 at node j, 0 at the other nodes, and node k, 1 at k, node, pardon me, 1 at node k, 0 at the other nodes. And each of these vary linearly because, if we go back a slide, oh, yeah, this slide will work, we can see that our displacements have to vary linearly. So our displacements vary linearly, linearly that means our shape functions vary linearly. All right, so we'll take a look at our shape function for node i, one at node i, zero at the other nodes, and we have this form here. This is the same form, right? It's that same linear form, linear in x, linear in y. It's the same as what we had for our displacement functions, right? We looked at how that element could possibly move, and that, derived, that, that showed us what the displacement function had to be, and so our shape functions have that same type of form. And so taking this form, and putting in these boundary conditions helps us to solve for all of these variables. And so we have the equation for the triangle area, 
based off of the nodal coordinates. And we have an expression for alpha i, for beta, and for gamma inside this expression for the shape function for i. Okay, and we have the same type of thing for our node j, the shape function there. Once again, one at node j, zero at the other nodes. We have that expression which resembles the linear formation in x and y that we have in our displacement functions. Triangle area equation, same as before, and we have our equations for alpha, beta, and gamma in node j. All right, last one, the shape function for node k. It's one at node k, zero at the other nodes. Same type of formation as we saw for those other shape functions, which is based off the formation for the displacement functions. Same equation for the triangle area, and we have our expressions for alpha, beta, and gamma that we see in this equation here. Once again, these values just come about from plugging in these boundary conditions into this equation. All right, so now we're gonna take those expressions and use strain energy and Castiglianos to get the elemental stiffness matrix. So the first step is getting an expression for the strain energy. And so here we're just using the basic strain energy equation where it's equal to one half force times displacement. Note that we are assuming linearity for this to be able to work. Well, we're making a little change there. I don't know if you were able to catch that, how we are now looking at the strain energy density. So instead of force and displacement, we're going to look at stress and strain. We're going to call, pardon me, we're going to call this the strain energy density with a very similar equation, except instead of force, we have stress. And instead of strain, we have, or pardon me, instead of displacement, we have strain. Now, when we look at how a two-dimensional element can deform, well, it's not just linear. It, it can, well, it can move in two directions, can't it? So let's go ahead and add the y direction, and let's add the shear component. It turns out that all of these can contribute to the strain energy density. And if that's true, we can go ahead and represent this in vector form, right? That strain vector being composed of the x normal, department the normal x strain, the normal y strain, and the shear strain, the stress vector being composed of the normal stresses and the shear stress, and we can get our strain energy by taking the volumetric integral of our strain energy density, right? And we can get that just by bringing the one half out, it's just a constant, and keeping these terms inside the integral. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and apply Hooke's law, and when we do that, we can get this strain energy equation into just strains, Pardon me, in terms of strains and the constitutive, oh boy, constitutive matrix, the constitutive matrix being just Hooke's law. That's Hooke's law. So we have one version for plain stress, and we'll have this version over here, and we have another version for plain strain. And so, really being careful when we do these types of problems, can we make a plain stress assumption? Can we make a plain strain assumption? really knowing the difference because they're not the same. If you have a plain stress situation, it's actually likely that you'll have some strain in that orthogonal direction that you might be pulling on it, such as you know if you have a thin material that you're pulling on, it's likely to become thinner as you pull on it. So there is strain, although there may not be stress in that direction. And the reverse is true for plain strain situations. All right, so now we have the constitutive matrix, and we're going to look at putting the rest of that strain energy term in terms of our strain displacement matrix. So we can have it in terms of our strain displacement matrix and our displacement vector. All right, there's our equation for strain energy. And making this substitution, we now have this equation in terms of our strain displacement matrices, our constitutive matrix, and our nodal displacements. All right, strain displacement matrix, yes. Strain displacement matrix, 
as the name entails, really is just a relationship between the strains and the displacements. And so our strain in the x-direction, our normal strain in the x-direction, would be the derivative of our displacement in the x-direction with respect to x, and that just means taking the derivative of each of these individual nodal shape functions with respect to x, and then each of these is multiplied against its corresponding displacement at that node, corresponding x displacement. And we can do that for the y direction, and we can do that for our shear strain. And we got six different terms here compared to the three that we had previously. All right, and so if we went ahead and rearranged this in terms of having our strain vector on the left side and our displacements pulling those on the right side, that would give us our strain displacement matrix. All right, we're just going to go ahead and expand out that matrix equation. So there's all of our strains. And what we're writing here is the same as what was on the previous slide. The only difference is, is that we are writing this in terms of a matrix equation, right? So what we have here, I mean, that's exactly what we have written here. It's just written in this form. We're just expanding out B. So that's what we have there. And recognizing what our shape functions are for the i, j, and k nodes, and taking the derivative of each of those with respect to x and y, this would give us all the entries inside of our strain displacement matrix. And so we can go ahead and make those substitutions here. All right, so now that we've done that, we can go ahead and apply Castigliano's theorem to our strain energy equation. So there's our strain energy equation. We're going to go ahead and apply Castigliano's theorem, but note that we actually have a vector of displacements, not a single one. You may remember from the lecture on strain energy that, or pardon me, on Castigliano's theorem, on the work energy theorem for deriving element stiffness matrices, we can apply the, or pardon me, we can apply Castigliano's theorem for each degree of freedom that there is an element. And we're going to do this the short way. We're going to apply it all at once by just making this a vector form of Castigliano's theorem. And so if we take this form, that gives us the following equation. And that becomes our stiffness matrix. And note that I made this substitution here. And we can do that because it is a constant strain triangle matrix, or pardon me, constant strain triangle element. And if that's the case, that means that every term within my strain displacement matrix is constant. Every term in my constitutive matrix is constant. And so if that's the case, that means that every term in here must be constant. And so we can go ahead and take everything outside the integral and just replace this volumetric integral with a thickness and area of the element. And so that becomes our stiffness matrix equation for the constant strain triangle element. Time for the reflection questions. So the first reflection question is, how do the displacements, that's u and v, how do they vary throughout the constant triangle, pardon me, the constant strain triangle element? And Related to that, how would the stress vary throughout the constant strain triangle element? Next we have, what is the difference between plane stress and plane strain? And so, noting that, the follow-up question is, is which matrix in that stiffness matrix equation changes depending on whether something is plane stress or plane strain? Next we have, how many total degrees of freedom are there in a constant strain triangle element? And that concludes this video on the constant strain triangle element.